If you were trapped in a time loop where you're murdered every single day, what would you do? I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the death loop in Happy Death Day. This girl is going to get murdered 10 times. Teresa here is walking to meet her friends and has no idea they planned a surprise party for her birthday. But as the girl walks towards an underpass, she sees a music box in the distance. It's playing the happy birthday song and she thinks it must be a prank. With no idea, she's about to get brutally murdered. The girl walks over to see who it might be from, but that's when she hears someone behind her. Turning around, the girl sees a masked man on the other end of the tunnel and he's staring straight at her. Freaked out, the girl threatens to call the cops on him and the guy silently walks out. Out of view. Terrified, Teresa continues walking, but just as she makes it to the other side, the girl hears something behind her. The music box has started playing again, and that's when the man suddenly drops down from above, trying to stab her. Scared out of her mind, she runs away as fast as she can, but trips and falls to the ground. The girl looks back at the underpass to search for the man, but he's disappeared. That's when someone pulls on her hair, and the last thing she sees is a knife headed straight for her face. That's one loop down, with ten more to go. Teresa has just been killed, but suddenly she wakes up in bed and looks around in confusion. Something is wrong, and the girl checks her phone, finding it's somehow her birthday again. This has all happened before, and that means her day has started all over, right back at her one-night stand's bedroom. Embarrassed, Carter here apologizes to the girl as he hands over some Tylenol, but she's too distracted to listen. Nothing about the situation makes any sense, and the girl decides to leave, hoping that this might be a weird dream. But soon she will suffer another horrifying death. Teresa heads to the hospital and meets this doctor that she's been sleeping with. Making sure the door's locked, she tries to tell him about what just happened, but it sounds too crazy to believe. Instead, he kisses the girl, ignoring her concerns, but that's when Teresa remembers that the last time she was here, his wife nearly caught them together. Moments later, they hear a knock on the door, and just like she remembered, the wife is there waiting on the other side. The only way the girl can know this is if it's already happened before, and she leaves the hospital terrified, realizing that at the end of the day, she's going to be murdered. Okay, this is freaky as hell. If you've been murdered by the boss baby only to realize that you've just cheated death, it's fair to say that this is the luckiest day of your life. Being stuck in a Groundhog Day time loop with a serial killer definitely sucks, but the good news is that we get to solve our own murder before it happens again. Now your first instinct might be to ask someone for help, which is why Teresa here decided to tell her teacher that she's literally gone back in time. But this was a huge mistake. It should go without saying that a medical professional who's only interested in science is simply not going to take you seriously, even if you're sleeping with him and it's clear that we'll have to figure out how to solve this on our own. Since we know that dying is where we start the day, the best strategy we have is to use the memory of each death loop and analyze it to find out who our killer is. That's why if it were me, I would return to the crime scene and write down every detail from memory before it fades because there's a lot of information to help us avoid getting murdered. Now first of all, she was killed in this tunnel on the campus of her university, but what's interesting is that it also appears to be under construction. If you look here, you can see there are tons of roadblocks to redirect foot traffic so the killer could count on no one being around at the time of the murder. This is not a coincidence and it probably means this guy's very familiar with the school campus knowing exactly where he could avoid any witnesses. With this in mind, it narrows down her list of suspects to only the students and school staff from her university, but we could take this one step further. The next thing to consider is how perfectly timed this was. In order for his plan to work, the killer would have had to know three things. The first is that Teresa would be traveling across campus at exactly 9.30pm. The second is that she would use this closed off tunnel. And judging from this music box, the third is that he would also have to know it's her birthday. This is really damning evidence, because it just so happens the girl was on her way to a surprise birthday party organized by the members of her sorority. They were the only people that knew where she would be, and all these details narrowed down our pool of suspects to one single house. If it were me, I would use the next time loop and take another path to the party. Then, by simply observing which sorority members are missing, we can narrow down our suspects to a small handful of people. Teresa here is wasting time explaining her situation to others, and she won't realize her mistake until it's too late. That night, the girl's pressured to go meet her friends and heads out by herself. Passing through a crowd of students, Teresa suddenly turns around and remembers that this is where she died last time. She decides to take a different route to the party, but notices that all the lights in the frat house are off. Something is wrong, but she continues walking up to the front door and tries to open it, quickly discovering that it's locked. The girl thinks she might have gone to the wrong house and checks the building next door, but it's dead quiet. That's when Teresa turns back around and sees the killer standing right in front of her. Startled, she punches the guy in the face, but the lights suddenly turn on, revealing that her sorority arranged a surprised birthday party just for her. The killer was just a frat boy playing a joke, but soon the real murderer is going to show up and turn this party into a bloodbath. Later, Teresa hangs out with her sorority leader when the frat 
Jetbro walks over. She apologizes for punching him, and he asks her to make it up by meeting him in private. The girl decides to accept his invitation and follows him to the second floor. Tracking the guy down to a bedroom, she walks inside, but finds no one's there. Taking a look around, she makes sure she's presentable, but suddenly the masked man appears behind her. She walks up to him to take off his mask, revealing that it's the frat boy in disguise, and he presses a button on a remote, activating his sound system. Neither of them can hear each other over the loud music, and the guy starts dancing by himself. When Teresa gets a text message, replying to her friend, she never notices the murderer sneaking into the room and brutally stabs the frat boy to death. Turning around, the girl tells the man that she's no longer in the mood and tries to leave, but then she notices the dead body on the floor. Floor. That's when Teresa realizes this is the killer and screams, dodging his attack at the last second. Grabbing a paddle, she slams it across his face and tries to escape, but the killer throws her on the bed. The girl knows exactly what's going to happen next, but there's nothing she can do to stop him as he breaks a glass bong before jamming it straight into her chest. That's two loops down, with nine more to go. Okay, this just got complicated. Even though Teresa managed to avoid getting murdered the same way as last time, the killer still knew exactly where the girl would be. In future death loops, this becomes even more clear as he shows up in a variety of locations whenever she's alone. With this in mind, it's possible that the killer has a special way of finding out where she is and is digitally tracking Teresa's location. What's interesting is that before she first got killed, her roommate admitted that she changed the girl's ringtone to the birthday song. Not only does it mean that this girl knows her passcode and could have secretly downloaded a hidden tracking app onto her phone, but that she's also suspect number one. With this in mind, the smartest thing to do is test this theory and go to a place where nobody expects us to be to see if the killer shows up. Now, assuming there's a way the killer's receiving GPS information from her phone, the smartest thing to do is leave campus and go somewhere that's both unexpected, but also convenient enough to get away with murder. This is the best way to lure the killer out of hiding on our own terms, and that's exactly why we need to bring some backup. If it were me, I would ask Carter here out on a date, and since it looks like they just had a one-night stand, it's very likely he'll say yes. Once he agrees, I would drive him out to a remote location where it's easy to be murdered so that if the killer shows up, there's a good chance he'll try to defend us and we can use him as a meat shield. Then, while he's being murdered, I'd use the opportunity to pull off the killer's mask and confirm their identity. It's a cold-blooded strategy, but the great thing about this scenario is that if the sh hits the fan, we can completely start over. As far as we know, up to this point in the story, there aren't any consequences if we die. And that means even if Carter here gets murdered, we can discover the killer's identity and allow ourselves to get killed, resetting time so that the boy gets to keep living. From there, we can and plan our next death loop knowing exactly who is after us and hunt them down during the day when they least expect it. Suddenly, Teresa wakes up gasping for breath and quickly realizes that she's back in Carter's bedroom even though she's just died. Checking her phone, she discovers that it's her birthday again and gets back to her feet. Now the girl knows for certain that she's stuck in a time loop and every time she dies, her life will reset to this exact moment until the murderer finds and kills her. Teresa storms out of the room as fast as she can, terrified that she will never be able to escape. Heading back to her Sorority, the girl walks to her bed in silence, and her friend Lori notices that something's wrong. She asks what happened, and Teresa explains that she's been reliving the same day over and over. It doesn't make any sense, but the blonde tries to convince her, revealing she already knows about the cupcake Lori made and the surprise party happening later tonight. Her friend still doesn't believe her, and that's when she explains she's going to be murdered. Concerned, the girl suggests that she stay in the room, and the blonde agrees, but this will be a huge mistake. That night, Teresa boards up the window and barricades the door with the dresser making sure the killer can't break in. It's a clever plan, but she's interrupted by the sorority leader, asking if she's going to the party. Suddenly, the power goes out across the campus, and the girl notices it's happening at the exact same time as it did in the previous loops. Later, she settles down to watch TV and tries to change the channel, but realizes that the remote is missing. She looks around her room, but that's when she discovers something strange on her desk. It's a birthday card, and inside is a spinning baby face with a threatening message. This must have been sent by the killer, and that's when the TV shuts off. Getting worried, Teresa Teresa walks over and turns it back on, seeing a news report about a local murder, but it suddenly turns off again. The girl realizes that the killer must have the remote, and that means he's hiding in this room. Panicking, she looks around and hears a strange noise coming from the bathroom. Going to investigate, Teresa walks inside to confront the killer, but gets distracted by the TV playing a commercial. The murderer must have turned it back on, but the girl has no idea he's right behind her. Suddenly, he lunges to attack, and Teresa manages to dodge him, hitting the man straight in the face. She tries to open the door and escape, but the murderer murderer quickly rushes at the girl, killing her once again with his knife. That's three loops down with eight more to go. 
Okay, this is getting out of hand. Teresa here is trying her best to adapt, but now she's been killed in three completely different locations, and it means she's now using these death loops to her advantage. Boarding up your room is still a good idea, but the biggest problem is that she's waiting for the killer to show up with nothing to defend herself. It's incredibly stupid, and if she was thinking clearly, she'd realize there are two different ways to approach this situation. The first is to relive each day without changing our routine, so we can plan ahead for the same scenario when the murderer tries to kill us. The second way to handle it is to change our schedule and force him to think on his feet to draw him out of hiding. If he successfully killed us in three different time loops, then it means we're way too predictable. So if it were me, I would make sure we brought something completely unexpected into the situation and set a trap for the killer. The best thing about this scenario is that we get the entire day to plan ahead, which is why I would use my next death loop to first figure out how to get my hands on a gun. Now it should come as no surprise that in America, this is a very simple process, and it's common knowledge that you can buy a gun from even the most ordinary places. Now guns aren't exactly cheap, so if money was an issue, then I would visit the doctor here and demand he give me $2,000, explain that if he doesn't fork it over, I'll tell his wife that he's having an affair. Then, we can use our blackmail money to legally buy a gun and file a report at the police station explaining that we've received death threats and are scared for our lives. Now this might seem counterintuitive, but it's not enough just to shoot the killer dead. We have to consider that if the death loop ends, we will be held responsible for their murder. And unless there's very clear evidence that we were acting in self-defense, it's possible that we'll be arrested and thrown in jail. Going to the police in advance gives us a clear record that works in our favor. And that way, if we manage to kill the murderer, the sequence of events will look like we were the victim all along. Suddenly, the girl wakes up screaming in Carter's room and freaks out. The death loop has started all over again, and the guy tries to get her to calm down, but she's too traumatized to listen. She quickly runs out of the building and stumbles through the campus in a daze, but that's when Carter catches up. With no one else to turn to, she breaks down in tears and begs him for help, but the girl doesn't realize this is going to get him killed. They sit in the cafeteria where Teresa explains that she's trapped in a time loop and has been murdered by a stranger every single night. The guy points out there has to be a reason why she's being targeted, and that's when the girl's ringtone goes off, playing a birthday song. He suddenly realizes that the murderer knows today is her birthday and is killing her for personal reasons. At first, the girl thinks it's ridiculous, but the guy suggests she make a list of people who know it's her birthday and start from there. The only problem is that there are a lot of suspects, but Carter explains she can use the time loops to follow each of them and find out which one kills her. That means she'll have to intentionally get murdered and it's a brutal plan. With no better ideas, Teresa decides it's the best option she's got. Later, the girl makes a list and starts tracking down the suspects one by one. She stalks each person in a different loop, discovering that they aren't the murderer, but always gets killed before she can ever find out who the murderer is. That's seven loops down, with four more to go. Frustrated from dying again, Teresa wakes up in Carter's room, but this time something's wrong. The girl's in horrible pain, and this has never happened on the previous loops before. She doesn't understand what's changed, but limps over to the door, determined to find out who's killing her. That's when Carter's friend barges into the room, and the girl suddenly faints in his arms. Neither of the boys understand what's happening, but soon the girl will discover that these time loops come with a terrible price. Later, Teresa wakes up in a hospital and sees the killer walking towards her bed. There's nowhere for her to run and the girl panics, terrified that she'll be murdered, but then she realizes it's just Carter. He explains she collapsed earlier that morning and Teresa's relieved she hasn't died yet, but that's when the lights shut off. Moments later, they turn back on and the doctor is suddenly right behind her friend. He tells him the visiting hours are over and the boy quickly leaves the hospital, but the doctor has some bad news. The man explains that her body has been so badly injured that Teresa should be dead and the girl realizes that all the damage from the previous loops are the only thing that's not resetting. That means with every death, her body will continue to break down, and she realizes she could still die if she loops too many times. Okay, this changes everything. The doctor just told her that based on her MRI scan, she should already be dead. There's a very good chance that if we continue to get killed, our bodies will simply shut down from the internal damage. So now we have to treat these time loops like a finite resource and only use them when it's absolutely necessary. With that said, we also have no idea what this is doing to the space-time continuum. There's good reason to think it's setting off a chain reaction of other death loops because every action we take is altering the course of history. This is the very definition of a parallel universe and even Peter Parker found out how disastrous this can be. Now, we don't know how many time loops we have left before permanently dying, but these kids haven't figured out that there's a completely different method to handle this problem. If it were me, I would strongly consider dropping out of school, booking an international flight, and going to the airport where there's security clearance. If the killer follows us there, not only would he have to buy a ticket, but he would also need to ditch his weapon to pass through security. It's also important to realize that this killer probably has a day job with real-world responsibilities and can't just take off to hunt us across the globe. When we look at it this way, it's pretty clear this whole situation 
situation isn't a curse, but a blessing in disguise. Right now, Teresa gets to live life with almost no consequences, because when things go wrong, she can reset to the exact same moment in time. Since the loop only ends when she gets killed, then it's reasonable to assume we could abandon all our responsibilities, live a long life of uninhibited freedom, and then die to start over again like it never happened. As strange as it sounds, the smartest thing to do here just might be to never solve the murder, and if we're going to get as much value out of these death loops as possible, then running away from your problems could give us the best life we could ever ask for. The girl tries to escape, arguing that if she stays here, she'll be killed, but the doctor holds her down. He promises to keep her safe, but the girl is not convinced. Distracting him, Teresa asks for a drink from the vending machine, and the man agrees. But as soon as he walks out of the room, the girl gets out of bed and makes a break for it. She sneaks through the halls and heads for the doctor's office, knowing that's where he keeps his car keys. Entering the room, the girl searches the desk and manages to find them, but discovers something horrifying. Inside one of the drawers is a baby mask just like the one the killer wears, and that means the doctor might be the murderer. Leaving the office, Teresa walks through the hallway when she sees the doctor searching for her, and the girl panics. He tries to calm her down, but that's when the killer suddenly sneaks up from behind and stabs him in the back. Terrified, the girl runs down the hall with the murderer chasing after her and races towards the parking lot. Searching for the doctor's car, Teresa presses a button on the key fob until she hears the vehicle beeping in the distance. She quickly heads to the lower level as fast as she can, moments before the killer comes sprinting out of the stairwell. He knows she's hiding nearby, and there's only one way for her to escape. Nervous, Teresa sneaks through the parking lot, keeping an eye on the killer, and notices he has his back turned. She makes a break for it, seizing her opportunity, but the man hears her footsteps. He chases the girl to the lower level, but loses track of his prey, never noticing that she's hiding behind an SUV. Desperate to find the doctor's car, she presses a button on the key fob, but the car starts beeping loudly. The killer now realizes where the girl is going, and Teresa sprints for the vehicle as the man chases after her, but she manages to get inside the car before the murderer can stop her. Putting the key in the ignition, she starts the vehicle and races out of the parking lot, but this escape plan is about to go horribly wrong. On the road, Teresa realizes that she's finally survived the night and celebrates, but that's when she notices something in the mirror. A police car is following after her, and she has no choice but to pull over. Stopping the vehicle, the officer walks up to the window asking for her license, and Teresa desperately explains that a murderer is hunting her down, but the man doesn't believe her. He thinks she might be drunk, and that's when the girl quickly realizes that if he arrests her, she'll be put in a cell where the killer can't reach her. Lying, Teresa tells him she had a few drinks earlier, and the officer has no choice but to take her to the police station. Okay, you might think this sounds smart, but getting arrested by this cop is not a good solution. Drunk driving in the state of Louisiana can get you at least 10 days of jail time, which means we'd be safe, but as soon as we're released, the murderer is going to kill us. Like I said earlier, if we're going to run away from our problems, I'd much rather spend my time on vacation than in a jail cell. Now, if Teresa here was thinking clearly, she would have realized that every single time she got killed, it was between the hours of 9 to 10 p.m. If the murderer was this consistent in each death loop, it probably means he's busy throughout the day and might even work at this hospital. Now, there are some pretty good reasons to suspect that this doctor is the killer, because he meets a lot of the necessary criteria. First of all, he works on campus, he knows it's her birthday, and he's got a f***ing baby mask in his desk drawer. This can't be overlooked, but there's one small problem. Since almost all the staff were gone, the doctor had the perfect opportunity to kill the girl in her sleep, but he didn't. The fact that she woke up in the first place is enough to tell us he's not the killer, and since we can see here that it's already 9.23 p.m., we should expect the real killer to be arriving soon. Now, we have to give credit where credit is due. This murderer is so committed to the cause that he'll kill just about anyone who gets in the way. As scary as that sounds, it's actually a blessing in disguise, because if we can rely on him to act recklessly, then the smartest thing to do might be to lead him into town. Driving this car out onto an empty highway is just going to make it easier for him to hunt us down where there are no witnesses to help. Instead, we should use his recklessness against him and lead the killer into a public area where there are enough people who can serve as both witnesses and meat shields to help us catch him. Now, since this story takes place in Louisiana, there are very few gun restrictions, and it's even legal for citizens to open carry in public. With this in mind, luring him off campus will give us a higher chance of running into someone who's carrying a gun and might help us stop him when we can't. The great thing is, the town traffic will also give us a better view of his vehicle. That way, we can memorize the license plate and use our next death loop to search the campus parking lot for the murderer's car until we find it. This allows us to create the perfect ambush for the killer when he least expects it, and kill this guy using his own disguise against him. The girl enters the policeman's vehicle thinking she'll be safe but suddenly another car runs the man over, killing him instantly. The murderer has finally found her, and she panics, realizing she can't escape. Teresa can only watch as the man holds a burning candle 
out his window, and she notices that there's a trail of gasoline leaking from the police car. The killer drops the candle, setting the fuel on fire, and the vehicle blows up with her trapped inside. That's eight loops down, with three more to go. It's the most brutal death she's faced so far, and Teresa wakes up again in Carter's room, feeling hopeless. The girl has no clue how to stop this time loop from happening, and is tired of dying, but the boy has been reset and has no idea what she's talking about. Teresa walks out of the room, and Carter quickly follows her into the hallway, wanting to know what she means. Frustrated, she leads him outside the building and explains she's forced to relive her birthday forever, only to get killed and return to this exact moment in time. He doesn't believe her, but that's when she predicts everything that's about to happen. It's undeniable proof Teresa is stuck in a time loop, and there's nothing they can do to break her out of it. They sit down at a diner to talk, when Carter hears her birthday ringtone again. Noticing how uncomfortable she is, he tries to cheer her up, but Teresa tells him she's exhausted. Her body is getting weaker with every loop, and she has no idea who is killing her. That's when she hears a news report about a suspected murderer being treated at the nearby hospital, and realizes that this man must be the killer. Hopeful, she heads to the hospital and warns the receptionist that their patient is about to escape, insisting they call the police. Running down the hallway, Teresa arms herself with a fire axe and slowly enters the murderer's room, but never notices that he's already standing right behind her. She searches for him and finds a dead police officer on the floor, but his gun is missing. That's when she turns around to see the killer aiming the pistol straight at her. He shoots the axe out of her hands, and the girl runs out of the room, scared for her life. In the hall, she warns the receptionist to escape, but it's too late. The murderer shoots the woman, and now he's coming for Teresa. Okay, this killer has managed to murder us in every single death loop so far, but this time it's much worse because he now has a gun. That puts us in a difficult situation because confronting him directly is guaranteed to get us killed. We also can't run away and steal the doctor's car because he wouldn't be here if there isn't a medical emergency. Now, grabbing the axe is an excellent idea, but not if you're taking it straight into a gunfight. We can clearly see that there's already blood on the window and it means the security guard is probably dead. If he couldn't stop the killer, then this girl doesn't stand a chance. Instead, Stepping inside the room is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. That's why if it were me, I would take the axe and then pull the fire alarm before going down to a lower floor and locking myself in one of the rooms. Now you might be thinking that there's still enough time to leave the building before he can chase us, but the problem with this strategy is that it's not going to help us stop the killer for good. Running away is just going to lead him outside where he has more opportunity to murder us, so it's a lot smarter to use the situation to our advantage and make sure he gets caught. Based on every other death loop so far, we already know that this guy has some way of finding our location, and is determined to kill us no matter what. That means if the man can see that we're still in the building, he's going to stick around to look for us, which is exactly what we want. The fire department would typically respond to a fire alarm in under 15 minutes, and if we stay in the building, it puts more pressure on the killer to leave us alone, because the longer he stays trying to find us, the more likely he is to get caught. Teresa's also completely forgetting that she still has her phone with her, and could call the police herself. She realized that this criminal was going to escape long before she ever reached the hospital, and it would have made a lot more sense to call the police from there instead of showing up and asking this receptionist for help. If she had called in advance, the police would already be here and we wouldn't be putting ourselves in unnecessary danger. She makes it to the elevator and presses the buttons, but the killer quickly catches up. There's no way she'll survive this loop, and he removes his mask before pointing the gun straight at her. Suddenly, Carter tackles him to the ground, and the weapon slides out of his hand. Seizing her opportunity, the girl picks it up and tries to shoot the man, but it's completely out of bullets. With no one to stop him, the murderer brutally snaps her friend's neck, and the girl has no choice but to keep on running away. She races down a hallway and finds the doors at the other end are chained shut, but the girl's in luck. There's just enough space to crawl underneath, and manages to squeeze through, but the killer is right on her tail. Catching up, he kicks the doors in and chases her to the bell tower, but all he finds is an empty room on the other side. The girl must be hiding, and he yells at her to come out, but never notices that she's right behind him. Teresa smacks him with a crowbar, knocking the man to the ground, and is about to finish him off, when she realizes that it's a bad idea. If she kills this man, the death loop might end, and her friend will be dead forever. She can't allow that to happen, and with no other option, the girl decides to end the time loop, waking back up in Carter's bedroom. That's nine loops down, with two more to go. As soon as she sees him, Teresa runs over and thanks him for saving her life. The boy has no idea what she's talking about, but after everything she's been through, the girl is happy to be back and leaves the building, determined to end this once and for all. She heads to her sorority where her roommate is waiting and apologizes for taking her for granted. It takes Lori here by complete surprise, but she forgives her and the girl heads out to confront the doctor. Meeting him in 
private, she makes it clear that she doesn't want to see him anymore and ends their relationship. The girl walks away to confront her killer, but this time she's got a plan, and there's nothing that will stop her from breaking out of the death loop. That night, Teresa goes to the hospital and sneaks up on the cop, holding a knife to his throat. She forces him to stand up and steals his gun, warning him that the murderer is about to escape and needs to go get help. Terrified, the police officer runs away and the girl enters the room, slowly approaching the murderer's bed. She knows he's pretending to sleep and tries to kill him before he can react, but the gun won't fire. The safety is still on, and the man takes his opportunity, smacking the pistol out of her hands. She runs out of the room to pick it up, but he manages to catch her at the last second and throws her straight into a wall. The girl is too weak to stand, and the murderer is about to finish her off, but she's got one last trick up her sleeve. Suddenly, the lights go out, and when the power turns back on, Teresa is nowhere in sight. She's managed to get behind him, and with the gun in hand, shoots the man dead. It's finally over, and the girl can move on with her life. Returning back to the sorority, she celebrates her birthday with Carter and makes a wish. The only thing she wants is for this whole thing to end, and blows out the candle, thankful that the police haven't arrested her. Suddenly, the girl wakes up in bed, but something's wrong. She's back in Carter's room and realizes it's her birthday again, meaning the time loop isn't over even though she killed the murderer. It doesn't make any sense, and she runs out of the building, heading back to the sorority. That's ten loops down, with one more to go. Bursting into her room, Teresa immediately begins packing her things. The only option she has left is to go on the run, or else she'll get killed again. Concerned, her friend asks what's wrong, and the girl tells her that there's nothing she can do to help. Trying to comfort her, Lori here offers a cupcake she made for her birthday, but that's when the girl remembers that she ate one in the previous time loop, and realizes it's been poisoned. Lori worked at the hospital where the criminal was being treated, and knew she could get away with framing him for murder. Okay, Teresa here is dumber than a sack of bricks. It was obvious that this girl was the killer, but the fact that it took her so long to realize this is just embarrassing. The truth is, every single one of our strategies would have uncovered this information, and if it were me, I would have used my very first death loop to follow Lori as suspect number one. Earlier, her roommate was the only sorority member who wasn't at the surprise party, and that's really suspicious, because she went out of her way to bake a cupcake for her to celebrate. We also know that her work shift at the hospital ends before the party, so the only reason she wouldn't be there is because she was still outside setting a trap to kill Teresa. Checking her car's license plate would have also told us it was her, because since they're roommates, there's good reason to think she's parked somewhere close to the sorority house, and it wouldn't take us very long to find the same car that chased us down. We also knew that Lori here was able to access the girl's phone because she changed her ringtone to a birthday song, so it's common sense that if the killer can find us wherever we go, that she must have turned on our GPS tracking to find our location. With so much evidence to work with and at least 10 days to discover the information, Teresa had no no excuse not to figure this out. If she's really this dumb, then it's important to admit your own limitations and find a different way to get some help. Now, Carter here could have been the best person to end these death loops because it took him all but 15 seconds to figure out that whoever's killing her knows it's the girl's birthday. He even helped her come up with a list of possible suspects, and this was after she had already been trying to solve the mystery for three full days. He's clearly a lot smarter than her, and that's why if it were me, I would use one of my death loops to kill him instead. It might sound counterintuitive, but if our death has somehow forced us outside of normal time, then there's a chance that if we kill someone, they might be forced to relive the same day as well. This would be a huge advantage, because if we trap Carter in a death loop with us, then not only would we no longer have to explain what's going on every day, but it also forces him to solve our murder for us in order to end the cycle. It might sound extreme, but there's no way to tell if this would work unless we try, and even if it doesn't, we can still reset the day and test something else instead. That's when the girl threatens to take the cupcake to the police. She's about to head outside when Lori throws the girl against the wall and locks the door so no one can get in. Confronting her, the roommate explains she wanted to kill her because she was jealous that the girl was sleeping with the doctor. Teresa is furious, and she kicks her friend in the leg, determined to get revenge. They start wrestling with each other, but the roommate gains the upper hand. There's nothing she can do to defend herself, but that's when someone knocks on the door, distracting Lori long enough that the girl comes up with a plan. Punching the roommate in the throat, she shoves the poison cupcake into her mouth, and the girl Girl backs away trying to spit it out, but Teresa isn't finished. She quickly stands up and swings on the chandelier, kicking her friend straight out the window. With the real murderer finally dead, the girl collapses to the floor in relief, knowing that the time loops have ended and she can die from heart disease like a true American. But what do you think? How would you beat Happy Death Day? Let me know with a comment down below. Thank you so much for watching, leave a like and subscribe, and check out the How To Beat playlist for more videos like this. Until next time, have a damn good day.